Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right, my name is Anthony Drummond. I am uh, the policy analyst for transportation and housing for Borough President Eric mm -hmm. Adams. And I have the honor again tonight of chairing our borough board meeting um, in lieu of our senior advisor, Ingrid Lewis Martin. So I'm going to go ahead and officially call this meeting to order. Um, so we have two presentations tonight. Um, one by CAMBA on a comprehensive approach to homeless um, prevention, and then we'll have a second presentation by the New York City Department of uh, City Planning on the zoning and flood resiliency. So with those two items, and we don't have anything to vote on tonight, so we're just gonna go right on ahead and um, start the meeting. So since we don't have quorum at the moment, so we're gonna go ahead and skip over the items of the approval of the minutes. And if during the duration of this meeting we do meet quorum, then we'll go ahead and do the approval of the minutes then. If not, then those minutes that will need to be approved will be tabled to the next borough board meeting. So with that, we'll go ahead and kick off on our first item. So we have a presentation from CAMBA. We'd like to welcome Abe Sober and Roy Ruest, who will be doing a presentation on behalf of CAMBA. Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me here. I'm super excited to have the opportunity to talk to the Brooklyn Borough Board. My name is Abe Solberg. I'm the program analyst with Canva Home Base, um, which is a homelessness prevention program. And we're here today to talk kind of about three things. We want to first sort of inform you about the services that we have available uh, to your communities and your constituents. Then we kind of want to illustrate uh, the extent of the housing crisis going on in Brooklyn based off the data we have. We want to tell you what we're doing about it and how we're using data to pinpoint our outreach. So Homebase is a citywide homelessness prevention program designed to provide comprehensive and uh, very personalized case management services to families and individuals going through a housing crisis. We offer a wide range of services, including short-term financial assistance, usually for rental arrears or for back utilities. Um, we offer job placement training and financial empowerment clinics, subsidy assistance and entitlement advocacy, legal services and informal mediation, resources on how to look for housing. Although Homebase doesn't help people find housing, we do offer a wide variety of resources to help people find a place. Housing rights workshops and HRA consultations with an HRA staff member on site. Um, our eligibility is varies case by case depending on the severity of the housing crisis. We run off a thing called the risk assessment questionnaire, which was developed by the city. And then there's a baseline income minimum. So 200% federal poverty level or 30% AMI area median income. And we have three offices in Brooklyn and two offices in Staten Island. And we also have two mobile units called the UCAN vans, which you can see up on the PowerPoint there. It's, it's over on the left. So this is our service area. Um, as you'll see, we don't serve all of Brooklyn, but we serve uh, the vast majority of it. We're missing Brownsville and East New York and um, the northern bit. Um, you can see our three offices there as well. We have one in Flatbush and two up there in Crown Heights. And uh, So uh, another thing we wanted to do is try to illustrate what exactly is going on with the housing crisis in New York. And if you guys have one of these green packets, you have this map in there. Um, there's also a map for the city council members, which breaks down the eviction risk by their district rather than by community district. Um, it's a little small on the PowerPoint, but over 40,000 evictions have been filed in just our service areas, so those zip codes there, um, since over the last 18 months, which if that number seems large to you, it's because it is a very large number. Uh, as you can see, the sort of darker areas are where it's a more dense, so Flatbush is a huge priority area for us, as is most of Crown Heights. And then that top map on the right, you'll see it actually a breakdown by uh, the percent of occupied units where an eviction would be filed. So we took the total amount of units in that area and then the total number of evictions and found the percent. So a little bit more context there. New York City evicts more people than any other of the largest cities in the country by a degree of about three times. Um, but it's still a relatively rare phenomenon in New York. Only 1.6% of renter households will have an eviction carried out against them in a year. And that's not even in the top 150 of buildings, of cities in the country. And with that, actually less than 5% of residential buildings are filing evictions in New York. So of the 155,000 um, residential buildings that are in our service area in Brooklyn, less than 5% of those have even filed an eviction. 
So we have an outreach team of three folks, um, and our goal is to try to get to those buildings, that 5%, try to find it, because it is really like finding a needle in a haystack when you're out there. And with that, informal evictions, which are evictions not carried out by the legal system, um, but still a forced move, those are estimated to be twice as common as an eviction that goes through the court. But one of the really tricky things about that is trying to identify where those are taking place because there's no paper trail at all. Whereas with a legal eviction to the court, you go through the court system um, and you can follow those uh, index numbers and, and follow the case. And in an informal eviction, you really don't have any idea. So we decided to take a different approach uh, to our outreach, We'd try something different. And what we wanted to do was to identify the characteristics in a building that might allow us to predict if that building was displacing people. And that way we could try to find from those 5%, we could identify them and target them and go there. And we could ideally, if the building is showing a lot of similar characteristics, find some of those informal evictions. So our approach is to identify those characteristics and then to utilize a machine learning model that effectively allows us to predict displacement and to actually better target our outreach. And what we did is we took all those, all those buildings, the 155,000 buildings there. We found 175 different related variables, neighborhood level variables and building level variables. And research would suggest that actually the neighborhood you're in and the building that you live in is an uh, indicator for your risk of displacement, which is why we chose to go neighborhood level and building level. So some of neighborhood level factors we did were public assistance cases, the overall population, the number of people who are doubled up in house, um, the median income, stuff like that, uh, communities of color, that population. And then we took building level variables, which is the number of residential units, the number of stabilized units, 311 requests, if the building was sold. And then we tracked these over a 10 year time span to see if the neighborhood had had a lot of sales in the last 10 years, how did that maybe indicate that people were getting pushed out? Trying to track some of those harder to find ones like uh, gentrification, which is a little harder to find. And what we found is that we were actually able to do this pretty well. We got a pretty good model working. Um, it has about a 95% accuracy rate. And so some of the more uh, predictive factors, you'd say, is um, we have the residential sales is not as predictive as we might have thought, but 301 service requests are, stabilized units are, the number of residential units, um, and then the number of evictions in a neighborhood. So if a neighborhood is evicting a lot of people, obviously those buildings are going to be at higher risk. So some of our key takeaways were we need to look really closely at landlord portfolios. One of the most interesting things that we found is that if a landlord owns 20 buildings, each one of those buildings is more likely to be displacing people than if a landlord owns just one. And that's something that would track with something that a lot of tenant organizers might tell you. You know, If your landlord's not in the community, they're not there um, to see what they're doing. And it also tracks with a lot of academic literature about how landlords are over leveraged on these large portfolios and need to scrape out as much money as they can. And displacing tenants is a really fast way to boost rents. Um, another thing we found is that stabilized units are not necessarily affordable units. A lot of the stabilized buildings were actually displacing people, which makes sense. So when we talk about those two things, we really need to separate them. Um, and then we also found housing instability. Uh, it disproportionately burdens communities of color. Um, and data can be used to effectively guide and allocate resources. And what does that look like for our outreach? Like I said, we have an outreach team of three. Um, so what we were able to do is, you'll see it up there. This is actually our map of where, how, how we're doing this. So if every building is coded. It's either critical risk, because this model puts out a percentage risk. So it says this building is you know, zero to 100% likely to be displacing people. And buildings that are 85% or higher are critical risk. Buildings that are 50% or higher, so it's still more likely to happen, we're calling those high risk. And the blue buildings is the ones where it's less than 50% of the likelihood. So those are low risk buildings for us. Um, and then we developed this little app and you can kind of see it in the picture, but on the next slide it shows it better where you can actually click on the building and you can see its risk profile. You can see a couple things about you know, how the, resi um, the stabilized units might have changed over the last 10 years. Um, if that building has an abatement, how many residential units are in it. And so we're using this to guide our outreach. Um, and if this works, it goes kind of fast, but this is what the app would actually look like as it loops through on the PowerPoint. Um, so you can see, you click on a building, you get some information, and then you can click another link right there and it'll take you to the DOB building page. Uh, so. That's kind of what we've been doing, and I'm happy to answer any questions about it, um, especially about our services. We have three offices in Brooklyn, as I mentioned. Their addresses are here, and their addresses are in those packets as well for anyone who wants to pass them out. Um, and then for folks who might have constituents who are outside of our service area, there's a link at the bottom there, and you can find it on the website to find the other home-based offices 
that will serve uh, your communities. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Are there any questions from the board members? All right. We'll go here to start off. Here. Therese. Mm -hmm. You're here home base of homeless prevention. Yes. You're a group of three people. Teresa, I'm sorry, can you make sure to speak in the mic for a minute's recording? Thank you. You're a group you're a group of three people going around finding buildings that you think people would be displaced from. Am I correct? So not quite. Um, but but similar. So our outreach team is only made up of three people. Um, to try to go out and actually be outreaching. Our staff as a whole, I think, has about 190 people on it. Most of them are case managers who are handling cases for folks who are um, at risk of being displaced. Homebase is a, it's a citywide organization, or a citywide program that's administered by community-based organizations, which is why we only do that section of Brooklyn and all of Staten Island. Um, and what we found is that previously when we were doing outreach, we would go into communities that had, uh, you know, disproportionate risk, but still it was fairly low. Like uh, only 1.6% of uh, folks will have an eviction filed against them. And eviction is actually, it's the, it's the number one reason for shelter entry. So it's the primary cause of homelessness in New York right now. Um, so that's why we had to develop this model to try to go building to building. Because when we went out previously, we would park somewhere and hope that people, the right people would walk by and get our services. And that wasn't always working. So now we're trying to be more proactive and going door to door and utilizing all the data from the city to get there. Plateau. Camacho, see me four. Hold on, Camacho. I'm going to go to Flateau and then you. Richard Flateau, Community Board 3. A um, couple of questions. One, have you noticed any trends over time with the evictions? And then the second thing, I didn't hear you mention the income of the tenants. And wouldn't that be probably the biggest factor? Like if somebody lost their nope. job. So I can, so to the income point, income is a big factor and it is one that we actually, we look at. Um, we look at it on a neighborhood, neighborhood wide basis because we're not able to get individual incomes for folks living in buildings. So we take the median income from the census tract and also from the census block, which is a slightly smaller area to help pinpoint our risk. Income isn't actually always the uh, biggest source uh, or the, the biggest risk factor. I think lots of research has shown that previous time in shelter is a huge indicator of future shelter risk rather than income. Um, and one thing that we do, because we serve a lot of a lot of working people who might, it's because it's short-term emergency assistance, folks who still have their jobs but might have fallen back due to a family emergency of some kind, like those are the people who we can really try to help the most. Um, and then could you remind me of your first question one more time? Yeah, um, what trends have you seen oh, over trends time with over the evictions? I think, Roy, do you want to answer that one? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Roy is our community liaison, by the way. He, he's the one who's actually going out and doing it, so he might be able to talk more about what he's seen. Thank you. Like he said, uh, I'm out there all the time. I'm going building a building, knocking on people's doors. Uh, one of the biggest uh, trends that I've seen in the past two years of doing this is that a lot of people get evicted because they're uneducated in how the housing system works in New York City. They don't know how the le legal process works. They don't know how the court works. They don't, know, they don't even know how an eviction process works. They don't even know that, that the police or the landlord don't have the right to displace them physically. Like, they have to go through a court process, get an issue out, a warrant out to, to a... I'm so sorry. have evictions been going down? Are they going up? Have they been stable over the last few years? I wouldn't be able to tell you that information. I think it's more of a good... So I've only actually been with Homebase for about nine months. So my long-term trends aren't probably as, they're not as, I'm not up to them as much as I would like to be. I think the most recent report was that actual Marshall's notice evictions were down by about 15% this last year based on, uh, thanks in large part to the right to counsel law. Um, eviction filings, we haven't seen any indication that they've gone down at all um, from when that started to We've been getting data for the last 18 months, so that's what I've been able to compile. And that uh, stays relatively stable throughout every month and hasn't really changed much. I think there are trends as far as uh, specific landlords might be more inclined, if you would call, call that a trend. Um, but that's, yeah, that's probably as far as I can answer that. Okay, 
Camacho? Uh, CB4, uh, Chairperson. Uh, Bushwick is not in this map. Obviously, obviously, a lot of uh, a lot of farmers uh, find it somewhere when they want to throw us out mm. and come inside and charge us four thousand dollars. Eventually, we'll be in this map somewhere. When you know when our rent and our people are not longer there, so I don't know why we're not on here. And maybe you can tell us uh, one why we're not on there. And uh, or two, I, I really don't think I need a survey. I know my people are not there. No, no, no. Uh, of course. Uh, Campbell Home Base isn't contracted to serve in Bushwick, so we don't have any of the information for it. Uh, that's the only reason why it's not in there. I believe that Riseboro is in Bushwick, and uh, that link at the bottom there is you can find your Riseboro office and um, likely talk, talk to them, and I think they get some of the same information we do. Okay. Go ahead. Kim Robinson, Council Member Samuel's office. Okay. You mentioned there's a data um, base or uh, information where they can actually go and click and find out information about the building. Mm -hmm. Who does that? Is that the case manager or the client? So that would be the outreach team often. Um, when they're going into buildings, one of the ways to start conversation, you know, you'd say, we've noticed this building has lost some stabilized units over the last five years. That's usually an indicator people are being displaced. Or, you know, you go onto that page and you say, oh, we've noticed that this building is racked up you know, several HPD violations in the last couple months that are still open. Um, are you, it's usually an indicator of a, of a poor landlord. Um, something like that. I'm sorry, there's a follow-up question with yep. that. So let's say you do notice that there's a building that falls in those categories. Mm -hmm. What does home base do? So ideally, that building then gets captured by our, our mapping, mapping tool. And when we go out into those zip codes, we're able to see the building and go into it and, and knock on doors and try to try to make conversations and effectively get, get people our resources if they need them. Okay. CB17. I am Barrington Barrett, Community Board 17. I would like to know, um, you've listed several zip codes there, but I know you've noticed you have omitted 11203. Does that mean that there's no eviction file in this zip code? No, so that just means that we don't serve the zip code. Oh, okay. So. These, the only zip codes we serve are gonna be on, I think it's the third slide, and then they're also at the bottom of the map, so I have them listed all out. So if your zip code's not on there, it doesn't mean that people aren't being displaced. It just means we don't have the data for it, so we can't comment on it. But is it where someone from that zip code could get assistance from your agency? Likely not from Canva, uh, but they could speak to their home base provider and see if they're able to get the data, yes. And who would that be? What Basis is that because it's not listed here. Is one one is that in one one two oh three? Is that northern or it's oh that's probably Riseboro then. Okay. Would be my guess. Okay. Just, oh, just, right. oh yeah. Any oh, other right questions? Yeah. Not so much a question. Uh, so Gormani Bravo Lopez, Councilmember Levin's office. Um, obviously we've been in touch with you guys in the past. Yep. I just want to thank you guys for coming out here to present today. Um, but also state that Canva, obviously working with them from folks who may reach out citywide that aren't getting the services they need directly from DHS. I think they've been fantastic in connecting folks, where even if it's not in their catchment area, to Riseboro, or the DHS actually keeps on the Department of Homelessness website a list of service providers by zip code. So that's just another area. But I know they've been fantastic in connecting when they cannot uh, provide those services themselves. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Ms. John. Nijani Granville, Community Board 8. Can you tell me basically what percentage of Brooklyn you do cover? Uh, we cover, what would you say, right? 70% of it? 70 or 80% of it? We cover a, a pretty good bit. All of it um, east of, or west of Ocean Avenue is us, and then all the way up to Gowanus. And all of your maps are available on your website? Uh, no, not, not currently, no. Okay. But I'd be happy to, I, my card is in there, and I'm happy to email them okay. to whoever. And our service area is available on our website. All right, for, thank you. For the cashman. Okay, um, any more questions? One more round? Okay. Thank All you right. so much. All right, thank you very, very much. So before we go on to the second presentation, I'm gonna ask uh, Keisha here to do an attendance roll call. So let's do a check here to see if we have met quorum. All right. 
Councilmember Barron. Councilmember Carnegie. Councilmember Cumbo. Councilmember Deutsch. Councilmember Espinal. Councilmember Eugene. Councilmember Brandon. Here. Councilmember Yeager. Councilmember Lander. Councilmember Levin. Here. Councilmember Mizell. Here. Councilmember Ampre Samuel. Councilmember Menchaca. Councilmember Reynoso. Councilmember Traeger. Councilmember Williams. <coughs> Community Board 1. Community Board 2. Community Board 3. Here. Community Board 4. Here. Community Board 5. Community Board 6. Community Board 7. <coughs> Community Board 8. Here. Community Board 9. Community Board 10. Here. Community Board 11. Community Board 12. Community Board 13. Community Board 14. Here. Community Board 15. Here. Community Board 16. Community Board 17. Here. Community Board 18. We do not have quorum. <laughs> Did not meet quorum. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll now move on to our second presentation from the New York City Department of City Planning. We have representatives of the Department of City Planning here tonight to provide an update as part of its community outreach towards achieving permanency or for the special zoning regulations that apply in the floodplains as part of its strategy to reduce flood risk and improvement. And we have some representatives here that will be presenting to you all this evening. Great. We'll take it away from here. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, so I'm Michael Morella. I'm the director of waterfront planning for the Department of City Planning. Um, and before we begin to talk about the recommendations that um, we're going to be uh, discussing tonight, I want to just sort of take the personal note about um, resiliency and, and the risks that we face as a uh, waterfront city. Um, New York City has 520 miles of waterfront. A rather significant portion of that is, of course, here in Brooklyn. Um, and with that comes the inherent risk of being located on a coastline. Um, and when Hurricane Sandy hit, I have to say, I was the director, I've been the director since 2011 uh, of waterfront planning. And so personally experiencing that and seeing the devastation six and a half years ago, that occurred from Hurricane Sandy and the areas that I have worked with for many years and have come to love, it, it's really devastating to see. And so right after Hurricane Sandy, going to places like Red Hook, going to uh, Coney Island, Manhattan Beach, um, Sheepshead Bay, et cetera, all of these communities, uh, Gerritsen, um, Canarsie, all of these communities and seeing the suffering that Sandy wrought was, was difficult, personally difficult. Um, but I have to say that as a city, we have made strides and we have rebuilt uh, homes along the waterfront and those homes are being built to better standards now. And that's an important aspect of the work. And that was made possible in part by some zoning changes that we passed shortly after Hurricane Sandy, but were done as an interim or a temporary measure. And so we're now coming back six and a half years later, reflecting on the lessons learned and looking how we can improve those regulations and make them permanent. And so that's really why we're here tonight. And, and this is an important step, building on the work that we've been doing for the past six and a half years, working with local communities to understand the risks and to formulate strategies. Um, and in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be coming out with a draft proposal, and we're going to be right. This is being written in plain English, um, so that the first document that community boards and other members of the public can see and understand is a document that can be understood by a layperson. Um, so we're doing our very best to make certain that's written in such a way that is not the technical zoning jargon um, as a as an important first step. Um, and then from that, we're going to be building and to towards environmental review and ultimately to, to ULURP certification. Um, but as that first step, we want to make sure that we are able to communicate this in a very, very um, simple way that, that folks without uh, knowledge of zoning can understand because this is a challenge for us. This is a challenge for the city that we have to face, that being a coastal city, we have this, uh, these risks that we have to overcome. And so tonight, we're giving you a sneak preview of that proposal 
um, that will be coming out in a few weeks uh, and for which there will be a whole lot more public engagement over the course of the next several months. Um, but we want to give the opportunity for the, uh, for the borough board to hear it as a, as a sneak, uh, sneak peek first. Um, so let me turn it over to my colleagues now. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to the, the Borough Board for having us tonight. Uh, my name is Katie Ferrara. I am a resiliency planner in DCP's Brooklyn office. And uh, as Michael said, we're here tonight to discuss the Department of City Planning's preliminary proposed updates to zoning as it applies in uh, coastal flood risk areas in our floodplain. And we're gonna provide you tonight an overview of the, the draft zoning proposal and a plan for upcoming outreach. Um, and as Michael said, we're, we're well ahead at this point of, of a, a ULERP or a pu official public review proposal. So we're here to discuss it at a preliminary level tonight. And so first I'll, I'll describe some of the context uh, that provides the reason why uh, we regulate some aspects of flood resiliency planning through the zoning code. And I'll describe the outreach process that we've gone through in Brooklyn and citywide uh, over the past few years and, and some of the things we've learned from your coastal communities. Uh, and then my colleague Manuela will describe the proposed zoning updates uh, that DCP is recommending for resiliency uh, and the, the project timeline ahead of us. So first, as, as you know, uh, the city, and particularly Brooklyn, uh, face serious flood risk across a wide and diverse uh, geography. And in many places in Brooklyn, coastal flood events can be experienced in properties and in areas that really don't even feel all that coastal. There's really a, a very wide uh, inland area that can experience coastal flooding. Um, and, and we're concerned in particular with uh, areas called the 100-year floodplain and the larger area called the 500-year floodplain, uh, which represent different levels of, of risk of, of flood during, uh, coastal, during coastal storms. Um, and in Brooklyn, uh, as pointed out on the slide and, and in your packet, uh, we have almost 30,000 buildings located in our 100-year floodplain, uh, and that amount almost doubles uh, when you expand out to the risk faced across the 500-year floodplain. And uh, just for a little context, 500 years, 500-year uh, floodplain, you label it that way, 500 years sounds infrequent, um, but as I'm sure many of you uh, recall looking at this map um, and looking at the two areas, uh, during Hurricane Sandy, the, the floodwaters went well past the 100-year floodplain uh, projected line and, and well into the 500-year floodplain area and affected about half the lots in that area. So it is a very real risk that we face. And as you also know, Brooklyn has a particularly diverse array of building and neighborhood types across its floodplain, everything from uh, some of our larger uh, campus style buildings and communities uh, to uh, attached row homes to uh, small bungalow neighborhoods. Um, and each of these neighborhoods and buildings really face a unique set of, of uh, risks and challenges uh, when retrofitting or, or rebuilding on their lots and recovering from storms. And so I, I just want to note that while tonight uh, from Department of City Planning uh, and while we're talking about the zoning resolution, uh, we're really focused on regulations that affect buildings and construction and ensuring that, uh, that buildings are, are uh, constructed to withstand uh, uh, flood impacts and to recover quickly when needed. Um, but this is just one part of a comprehensive uh, city thought and strategy around uh, the idea of flood resiliency that includes planning also for uh, coastal defense mechanisms and uh, infrastructure improve improvements inland, and as well for uh, preparing residents and businesses for things like evacuation and recovery if and when needed. Uh, but a little bit more about uh, how and why we specifically regulate building and constructions, uh, especially in uh, flood risk areas. Uh, so that comes at first from FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which uh, maps uh, across the city and across the country these 100-year and 500-year floodplain areas, uh, and also the expected flood elevation across the 100-year floodplain. And FEMA also administers the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, which sets uh, flood insurance uh, requirements for any uh, uh, 
building that holds a, that ha involves a federally backed mortgage in that 100 year floodplain, they're required to purchase flood insurance. Um, at the same time, uh, the NFIP, the flood insurance program, uh, provides somewhat of an incentive uh, to, uh, to, to retrofit and to flood proof buildings because when buildings are elevated or undertake uh, specific flood proofing mechanisms, that property owner's uh, uh, flood insurance premium goes down. Um, and so we have our New York City Building Code, Appendix G, which specifically applies to buildings in the floodplain, uh, which uh, makes sure that those uh, requirements for uh, flood insurance, uh, uh, the National Flood Insurance uh, applicable buildings uh, are met for building elevation, flood proofing, et cetera, for all of our new and uh, substantially uh, uh, rebuilt buildings. Um, and also what, what happens here with the, uh, so what happens here with the zoning resolution is that the role of the zoning resolution is to accommodate those requirements and make sure that uh, there's flexibility so that any building uh, in the floodplain has the ability um, with, uh, within the city's land use regulations and building dimension regulations to also be as resilient as possible and uh, have to incur the lowest flood insurance premium as, as they can. Uh, so DCP has uh, had uh, uh, two instances of, of uh, citywide updates to uh, zoning as it applies in the flood zone uh, since 2013, uh, the intent of which both times was to fill, better facilitate recovery following Hurricane Sandy. So first in 2013, we had a temporary uh, zoning text update that removed certain barriers that we were aware that buildings uh, that, were, that were rebuilding following Hurricane Sandy and how now had to meet uh, these uh, more advanced building code uh, requirements and flood insurance requirements uh, were facing. So we removed those barriers um, through an emergency zoning amendment provision in 2013 uh, that does have an expiration date. Uh, and then in 2015, uh, uh, certain neighborhoods uh, were, were facing additional challenges uh, based on uh, constraints of their of their lots and other um, and 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 um, uh, oftentimes these were these were older neighborhoods that faced challenges with the documentation they needed to provide to get building permits uh, to rebuild um, and so there were select neighborhoods that were applicable to what was called our uh, special regulations for neighborhood recovery or SRNR in 2015 um, that simplified those documentation requirements uh, for some of those uh, uh, older older buildings um, and in in Brooklyn. The application uh, was in Canarsie, uh, Sheepshead Bay, Gerritsen Beach, uh, Seagate, and Brighton Beach, if I recall. And so I just have a couple of slides to qu quickly go through um, what, the, uh, what some of these buildings look like uh, b before they were recovering from Hurricane Sandy and, and after with, uh, with the current tech zoning tax provisions that are in place. Uh, it might be a little bit hard to see on, on the screen, um, but it, this is available in your packet. This is a, a row home in Red Hook and some of the things you can see happened in the, the after case here is that there was a, a internal elevation of the livable space. You can see the, the windows are elevated and, and the, the basically the only thing left on the ground level is the, the entryway, so all the livable space is above uh, what's, uh, what's called the design flood elevation for safety. Um, and they've added a, a flood vent for wet flood proofing at the ground level, if you look closely. And they've also added uh, some floor area after a setback on what was previously the, the roof or the highest point of the building. And it's possible that this floor area actually replaced uh, lost livable space that would have been below grade previously, um, but had to be filled in to meet current building code. And next, a, a, a very different type of, of built condition and neighborhood. This is a uh, uh, one of the, the courts neighborhoods, the bungalow courts in Sheepshead Bay. Um, and in this case, the, the neighborhood was, was rebuilt and elevated above the flood level. Um, and of course, this was quite the undertaking uh, through our Build It Back program. Um, but it was also a tremendous opportunity for DCP to learn some of the, the critical challenges that uh, neighborhoods like this were facing that led to the proposal for uh, the, the SRNR um, for, for documentation and also allowing this uh, kind of stout building envelope that might not fit with, with zoning otherwise on these uh, very narrow lots. Um, so this, that SRNR came from experiences like this and now applies more broadly than, than uh, individ these individual build it back court neighborhoods. So now I'll describe some of the outreach that DCP has done on zoning resiliency so far over the last several years. Um, and a few of the, the key issues and concerns that we've heard through this outreach process across the Brooklyn floodplain. 
Um, since Sandy, the department has conducted a number of studies to understand uh, what the, the barriers and incentives are for property owners in the floodplain to undertake resilient construction and retrofitting. Uh, and the neighborhood-specific studies in Brooklyn were focused on uh, Canarsie, Sheepshead Bay, and Gerritsen Beach. Um, but we also conducted uh, citywide studies um, on certain uh, industries and building types uh, that were, were uh, common in the floodplain, such as uh, like, uh, ground floor commercial retail and art spaces. Um, and in addition to those studies, uh, we came out to uh, community boards, uh, to uh, council members and others representing uh, floodplain uh, communities and neighborhoods, um, and also held a number of uh, zoning and urban design workshops with both architects and community groups. Um, to, to understand some of the, to better understand some of the, the challenges and, and uh, the, the design ideas that were being generated in, in flood risk communities. Um, and I hope that uh, some people were able to make it to the, the workshops that we had in 2017 in uh, Red Hook and uh, in Coney Island. And uh, I'll note that uh, over the last summer, uh, I think in June of 2018, we published a summary of, of the outcomes of all of that outreach um, uh, in, a, in a summary document. Um, and just to, to kind of quickly go through the key uh, findings from all of that outreach, um, uh, there was definitely several key concerns about current zoning and, and flood resilient design in general that we heard over and over again that is uh, part of the key goals of what we're aiming to address now. So first, in that, in that uh, photo number one there, uh, it's representing that, that some people want uh, more flexibility than they're currently given in order to elevate buildings above uh, today's projected flood level, uh, since they understand that sea level rise and climate change will mean potentially more impactful flooding. Uh, and in addition, uh, we've heard from uh, people with properties outside of the 100-year floodplain uh, into the 500-year floodplain uh, that know that flood risk is increasing for them and that, that want some of these flexibilities to be applied to their properties as well. Um, number two is, is representing uh, something related to our SRNR process, um, which is that uh, that, uh, that uh, text amendment applied what's called the, we call the cottage envelope, which is what I said, that, that short and, and stout uh, and uh, minimal side yard, uh, kind of bungalow style building, uh, which is a, a unique envelope that wasn't previously allowed in zoning. There's an interest um, in allowing that in a, in a wider spread of, of communities across the floodplain. Uh, third is, is a significant concern a lot of, across a lot of neighborhoods in, in Brooklyn. Um, these are homes that uh, happen to be built in areas d uh, designated by the zoning resolution as manufacturing districts, uh, many of which are in the floodplain. Homes in these districts are not able to get, at this point, uh, building permits to do the kind of uh, rebuilding and retrofitting that they would need to become uh, flood resilient. Uh, so there's, there's an interest in uh, expanding the rights of those properties at this time. Um, Number four and five relate to uh, the, the kind of public realm experience that people want to see and want to improve in floodplain neighborhoods. Uh, number four, you see kind of a common uh, a risk of an all residential building uh, where they've just been able to only put parking on the ground floor and they want some, people want some more improved design requirements to, to improve the streetscape um, and, and uh, things that are going on along the sidewalk in these kinds of places. Uh, number five represents a, a, a commercial property that has chosen to, to elevate instead of, uh, as we'd prefer to see in many cases, keep that entry at the, at the sidewalk level, at the ground level. Um, we want to support more businesses taking on dry flood proofing, what's called dry flood proofing, um, uh, to get that to happen and to activate the streetscape with the understanding that it can be quite an expensive undertaking. Uh, and number six, we also spoke with a, a lot of uh, business owners over the last few years and have come to understand the challenges that they face uh, both in regard to flood risk and also uh, with the uh, critical space they often have below grade or below the flood elevation for storage operations and they're in need of more support for um, figuring out how they can, how they can move the, their space around um, to get out of flood risk. I'll turn it now over to uh, my colleague Manuela. Thank you so much. Um, so now I'm going to go over some of our recommendations uh, that we uh, are anticipating to uh, release within this plain language version of the proposal in a couple weeks. So um, first of all, uh, I think that when you think about zoning, the first thing that comes to mind is really land use planning. And um, in this particular case, for this text amendment that we are uh, trying to advance, 
we are not really trying to change land use patterns across the city's floodplain since it's such a vast area that for a citywide tax amendment, it really doesn't make sense to, to think about it uh, in that level. So uh, we know that in some instances, it may be important for us to think in the local level that perhaps we should limit density in areas that are gonna be probably face daily tidal flooding in the, in the near future, um, and then other areas in which uh, coastal protection can assist and infrastructure improvements can assist those neighborhoods to be protected from future flood events, that those areas could be potentially get more density in order to get more resilient building stock. However, as I mentioned, uh, the purpose of this presentation tonight is about the citywide tax amendment, and therefore we're just trying to support the plan density by giving this flexibility that Katie was talking about within the zoning framework in order to facilitate resilience improvements for all building types across the city's floodplain. So um, this slide here is kind of summarizing the goals that we came up with uh, after speaking extensively with communities. And um, it had been a, a really, really incredible experience, uh, particular um, for me and our team to be able to discuss this with communities. Um, communities at this level, they're really, really engaged in how building code works. And therefore, uh, Katie mentioned several of the points that I'm gonna be uh, mentioning again uh, to you all in terms of the recommendations. So first of all, it's really important that we think about, on a geography perspective, about the future floodplain and what areas in the city will be at risk in the next couple of decades. So therefore, the first goal here is to encourage resiliency across the city's current and future floodplain. The second goal uh, is in regards the idea that sea level rise projections will increase the height of expected floodwaters in the event of a coastal storm. And therefore, we need to uh, allow the flexibility for building owners to incorporate sea level rise projections. So buildings that are built today are retrofitted, elevated, they can be protected for the next 10 years or the next 50 years, since when we build buildings, we want them to be in place for a long time, right? Um, so that's about the, the second goal. And the third goal here is one that is extremely important, especially for New York City. Our floodplain is basically built. Uh, we have more than 90% of lots already built, and that comes with big challenges that we have all this building stock that is already in place and they need more flexibility to incorporate what we call partial mitigation strategies that include, for instance, elevation of important equipment, important spaces above the, the flood level. So for those, we really want to advance our partial resiliency strategies within the zoning to allow for, for those measures to be employ, uh, deployed in any uh, type of building across the floodplain. And then last, um, goal number four is really talking about the next storm. So we learned a lot uh, with the two temporary tax amendments that we passed in the past uh, couple of years. And it's important to have the framework ready in place in the event of a future storm. So once we have a next Sandy coming, uh, the city should be able to easily have the zoning provisions that facilitate recovery, that facilitate all buildings to be reconstructed and, and retrofitted. So I'll, I'll go over some of our recommendations more into detail that kind of touch base in each one of those four goals. So um, the first recommendation here is in regards to applicability of this optional flexible rules into the zoning. So uh, Katie mentioned about the 500 year geography. This is a geography that very closely relates to the 2050s projection uh, with the 28 inches of sea level rise, and uh, that also kind of reaches the 2080 projections, so the moderate uh, projections for 2080. And so we think that it's really important to offer flexibility for lots that are not only in the 100 year flow plane, but also in the 500 year flow plane, so we can have property owners already proactively including resiliency within the, the work that they do. Um, aside from that, you see the list on the bottom talking about some citywide measures that we think it's important to, uh, to um, touch base with this proposal. So the first one of them is in regards to uh, emergency generators and emergency power systems. This has been uh, something that um, has been incorporated within campus housing across the city with HPD and IHS portfolio. 
And there were several issues that these uh, agencies faced when trying to incorporate, let's say, mechanical buildings within campuses and, and, and uh, build uh, and have emergency generators for, for those campuses so people can return to their homes faster. So for in those instances, we would like to offer uh, more flexibility for any property owner across the city to incorporate emergency generators. In that way, we can really have a faster uh, recovery process and people can get back to their homes. Hospitals can be functioning uh, better after a storm and things like that. And then the other item here is something that I already spoke about. So in regards to the future storm, we don't know which area of the city may be impacted by the next coastal event. And therefore, uh, the set of rules that facilitate recovery need to be in place for whatever that area is, right? So whatever area that gets damaged should get access to those rules so the city can recover. So um, for that reason, it's important to note that uh, we're gonna have to be coming to all of the community boards across the city, all the community boards in Brooklyn to speak about these things and this project. So um, the next slide here is summarizing some of our recommendations for building envelope provisions. When I talk about building envelope, I'm really uh, talking about regulations that try to give shape, the shape and size of buildings uh, for all building types across the city. So the first one of them is in regards to height provisions. In order for us to, uh, one, uh, facilitate the building owners can elevate their buildings to sea level rise projections uh, so they can maximize uh, flood insurance premium reductions. They can be protected uh, for the future storm. And uh, also very importantly, they can relocate uh, important spaces that are usually, uh, that are today located within basements or cellars. Um, so this proposal would assist that uh, buildings can, can pursue the, that work in order to be resilient in the future. And um, Katie mentioned also about the instances in which we have a, a, a concentration of lots that are very small and face uh, challenges in, in rebuilding or retrofitting. And for those, we would like to uh, make permanent the cottage envelope, which is this envelope that allows for uh, resilient construction that's more into context uh, by offering more yard flexibility uh, in exchange of a height cap. So they are shorter, but yet uh, resilient and future-proofed. Um, and then last, on the bottom, you can see uh, some of our recommendations for existing building stock that may not currently meet the zoning code. And for those, they need slightly more flexibility so people can really retrofit their homes, especially attached buildings that need to evacuate first floors in order to wet flood proof. So those need more flexibility so they can relocate those spaces uh, above uh, harm's way. And oh, and I forgot to mention uh, homes in manufacturing districts. Uh, we've flagged around 800 of those instances. Uh, those building owners, they really need flexibility and we would like to recommend to uh, have that in place also so they can retrofit their buildings and also be safe. Uh, the next set of slides are more in regards to uh, building design. So um, one of the, the things that um, zoning can do, zoning is limited in, in so many ways. But one of the tools that we have is floor area um, allowances and, and the way we allow floor area to be uh, documented in buildings. So um, the first recommendation is to improve upon existing floor area exemptions that we have, uh, but make them better, make them, um, make, make them uh, allowed for all building types. So the first one is in regards to spaces that are dry flow proofed. Katie mentioned that dry flow proofing is very expensive. However, it is a very good measure for commercial establishments in order for us to keep having our commercial spaces located at grade uh, so people can access retail space at the grade level. So for those, we will be offering a minor uh, floor area incentive so they can dry flow proof those spaces and, and keep at grade with transparency and, uh, and everything that can act, help activate the streetscape. Uh, the second one is in regards to spaces that are wet flow proofed. For those, it's really about residential construction. They have to wet flow proof in order to allow the water to come in and out of the structure to equalize pressure. And that comes with uh, building code use restrictions. So that space can only be used for parking storage access. Or uh, it, doesn't, it, it, it doesn't make sense to count them towards floor areas since it's not being able to be used as living spaces. 
Um, the other one is in regards to flow area allowances for the elevation of mechanical equipment. Uh, we just want to ensure that people can elevate important equipment above the flood elevation. And last, uh, we would like to facilitate commercial businesses to relocate uh, subgrade spaces that are often used for accessory uses to uh, either the first or the second floor and then become, uh, make permanent some of our existing uh, parking allowances to facilitate parking to be placed uh, below the, the building. And last, make sure that we have good design standards for all these buildings, all building types across the floodplain so we can continue to have uh, a good streetscape. And then um, the next slide is a summary of our recommendations for what I was referring to as partial resiliency strategies. So those are really trying to assist existing buildings. So the first one of them is in regards to industrial businesses. Uh, we have a lot of businesses in the floodplain that have no floor area in order for them to relocate important office space uh, or mechanical equipment. So we will be, uh, the recommendation that came from the Resilient Industry Report is to at least allow around 500 square feet for them to build a mezzanine within the building or a little second floor uh, on top of the structure to put, let's say, an office space or um, important equipment that they want to make sure it's above the, the design flood elevation. And then uh, the next item on the side is talking about every other type of building um, and how we need to facilitate mechanical, electrical, and plumbing equipment to be put either on top of structures or within uh, a separate building uh, if you have uh, like a campus housing or more space within the lot so you can have mechanical equipment elevated also above the flow elevation. And the bottom one is uh, some things that we already have today in the books that we'd like to make permanent. Uh, they are more related to site improvements. So the first one is in regards uh, raised yards and berms. Um, so just want to make sure that those are allowed as permitted obstruction on yards and open space. And then float panels, which is one of the most popular uh, ways that you can uh, retrofit an existing building, is if you uh, deploy footings and then deployable uh, float panels in advance of a storm. And the, the last slide here uh, is summarizing some of our recommendations for what we are referring to as emergency rules. So uh, Katie actually uh, already mentioned all of these things, but in 2015, we passed this SRNR uh, regulations that facilitated recovery. So uh, if we have those in the books today, and if they can be triggered um, in, the, in the case the state declares a state of emergency, in the case we are having, uh, we're gonna be facing a future storm, then we will be able to um, move recovery faster uh, and allow properties to be uh, rebuilt, uh, any, anyone that has their homes destroyed, that they can more easily and, and quicker uh, provide a, a, a quicker path uh, to recover. So I'm um, gonna be closing up with the timeline. Um, so as we mentioned, we are currently developing this document that is a plain language description of what I just uh, presented to all of you, slightly more into detail. So we'll be releasing that in the next couple of weeks. And then we will be, we're currently uh, targeting the public review process to start later this year uh, with environmental review and then um, referral. So we are still very early in the process. And, um, and that's it. All right, well thank you thank very you. much. Um, before I open up the questions for the board, I'm gonna ask our land use director, Richard Barrick, you have a few comments and then I'll open it up for everyone here to ask questions. Yes. Thank you for that presentation. Um, so for adapting existing homes, um, though there would be a significant federal flood insurance savings that might offset monthly cost of taking out a construction loan. So many affected property owners would still have trouble affording such additional monthly payments on top of their existing mortgage. What consideration has been given by the administration to offset these costs, such as, for example, a real estate tax offset? Excellent question, thanks, and thanks for bringing that up, Richard. Um, you're absolutely correct. It, is, uh, it needs to be said that retrofitting existing buildings can be quite expensive. Um, there's no way around that. That's just um, the nature of the type of construction that would be required to become compliant with uh, Appendix G of the building code. Um, that said, 
the administration is very much aware of this issue, and it's something that we're that city planning is discussing with the mayor's office, with Office of Management and Budget, Department of Finance, and with uh, Housing Preservation and Development, looking at all possible avenues um, for uh, for making resources available, um, but no decision yet on that. Thank you. Um, it would be great by the time the zoning proposal gets to the city council that you could provide such response in more detail to the council. Noted. Um, given that to date there's been a limited number of major alterations that have met the uh, flood resistance standards, what incentives might assist property owners um, that might be are requiring to do these major alterations um, to now meet the flood resistance standards? So we're certainly cons considering the, the financial um, means to make it easier to make these investments. In terms of um, ways of offsetting the, um, the costs um, and providing additional incentives, um, it almost would suggest that you're, that you're indicating that you would be in favor of additional floor area, Richard. Is that, is that what you're getting at? If that entices it, that's certainly something the borough board can consider. Again, we'll, we'll take that into consideration. Community board, yes. But um, but other than and really the, the 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 overarching philosophy that we are trying to to stick to is what very much what Manuela described when discussing the overall land use spectrum for how we're looking at resiliency. That the zoning text amendment is not seeking to increase uh, density in in an area that we're largely planning on the existing densities that are allowed under zoning. Um, and so uh, we were not looking to have an automatic increase of, uh, of floor area to, as, a, as an incentive, but um, were there to be strong recommendations for such, and if that were to be something that was unanimously uh, uh, voiced by, um, by the borough board, that is certainly something that we would take into consideration. And, and besides floor area, obviously envelope flexibility. Yes, of course, yes, yes. along with the free floor area that Richard Barrick is suggesting, I'm just making sure this gets on the record, in addition to the free, free floor area that um, Richard Barrick is suggesting, that we also have additional height and bulk um, regulations to accommodate that free floor area. I have to tease you, Richard, on that one. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, uh, opening it up for our group here. First question, all right. CB. Teresa Scavo, Community Board 15, which includes every area you just discussed. Yes. What have you learned going to Gerritsen Beach? What have you learned in the courts? Yeah, great question. Uh, hi, Terry. Uh, I know you worked very closely with my colleague, Daphne, um, over the last few years, and you're aware that we had our two, two of our, our key studies um, of areas uh, noted as, as uh, specifically uh, uh, hard hit during Sandy uh, and with uh, land use challenges that, that merited specific studies were Sheep's Head Bay and, and Gerritsen Beach. Um, and now along with, uh, along with uh, the citywide proposal, um, uh, we're, we are also hoping to advance, planning to advance um, specific uh, zoning updates for those neighborhoods, um, including a, a special coastal risk district to limit density. And how do you do that in a place where you walk, there are no sidewalks, mm -hmm. there are no side yards, there are no rear yards. Half those houses, you don't know which is the front of the house and mm -hmm. which is the back of the house. That, is that a front yard or is that their rear yard? Mm -hmm. So how do you say leniency going forward uh, in Gerritsen Beach? We'll use them as the example. How do you say flexibility, the words that you're using, flexibility, mm -hmm. leniency, you know, we'll bend the rules here, we'll bend. You can't bend zoning rules like that, especially not in that community, because you are talking, we get the calls. By the way, you know, when I bought my house a few years ago, there was a deck, which if you look at Google Maps, there was no deck, but according to him, he bought the house recently, there was a deck. Now DOB shut him down because he added to the deck that was existing. These are the kinds of things, if you give them a little flexibility in Gerritsen, in the courts, mm -hmm. you're gonna have people living on top of people. Sure, so, so I think, and to be clear, we are looking to 
establish changes to zoning that would establish new rules. That would be more, that would provide greater flexibility than on the existing rules, but within those new rules, people would have to comply with those new rules. So it's not to say that people are able to bend the rules willy-nilly, it would be establishing a new set of rules. And so I just want to make certain that that is but clear. who's going to follow those rules? Is it going to be your house was overbuilt with no side yards, so you're grandfathered in? You're just going to... So, so there were certain elements of special regulations for neighborhood recovery, the 2015 Zoning Tax right. Amendment, that uh, allowed for uh, for relief from some of the documentation issues because of the scale of that issue was across neighborhoods was very much hindering the the recovery from Hurricane Sandy. And so that's that's a very specific issue about the documentation. We're not allowing the, uh, and that's set to expire in 2020. 2020. So uh, just a couple of years from now. We are not going to be allowing that provision to carry on without checks. One thing that we are going to be doing is that as part of the emergency measures, so th which is to say that it's, think of it as a glass box that in the event of emergency, you can break that glass and get those tools quickly to fight that emergency. That's going to be one of the types of things that we would have in that glass box is types of relief in the event of another either another Sandy, a tornado, some other type of emergency that gets declared that should we need to access that, we can access it quickly so that we could speed recovery, which is a key aspect of the work. So, Teresa, when we see the details of the language, I guess we could then look at those specific situations and try to see what might be the outcomes of how people will use them and abuse them or not, or whether the language needs to be Because improved. the problem in Manhattan Beach, they rebuilt. They didn't rebuild with resiliency. They just put their luxury basements back the way they were. Right, but now they have the flood insurance risk by doing what they did. So if they're not going to modify going forward, they're just going to have to pay that fee. And it's, and it's considerable. We should actually just take a moment to understand how the flood insurance program works, because this is, this is important. If your first floor, your, your first occupied floor is below the anticipated flood level, you pay a significant penalty. Do you have the slide on it? Yeah. Oh, great. No, it's uh, one more. I think, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, actually, I can't see the <laughs> limit. Um, so that if you are below the base flood elevation, you could be paying upwards of $9,000 $9, a year. Yeah. That's, that's some significant amount of money, obviously. Um, whereas if you are just at the base flood elevation, it's roughly 1,400. These are, and these are just rough numbers. But and if you were to be just three feet above the base flood elevation, that's an annual premium of 450. So the distinction between where you're placing that ground floor makes a huge difference. And it's important to note, these are the subsidized rates that the federal, through the federal program. And that Congress is continually discussing ending the subsidized rates, which would mean that if those go to actuarial rates, the $9,000 is gonna go up considerably. And today, in fact, in certain, there's homeowners in New York City who are paying upwards of $13,000 a year in flood insurance because they're, they're below the base flood elevation. $13,000, let me repeat that. So that's one of the major motivations behind why we're looking at zoning as a way of providing a mechanism to encourage folks to elevate above that to pay significantly less flood insurance. So the difference between $13,000 and $450, the math is pretty easy. Okay, um, we'll continue around. Any other members here? All right, I'm gonna open up. I saw a hand in the audience. Um, um, sir, before you, you gotta use the microphone. I have a number of questions, but um, maybe the first is really speaking about this. Um, extra insurance, I get it, $10,000. Sir, can you say your name? Oh, oh Douglas Fanning. I'm um, a resident in Red Hook, okay. um, homeowner and an architect. So. Um, at 10000 a year, I mean, to lift a home that's either part of a row house or an individual house could be half a million dollars or more. This is what you're asking homeowners to kind of take for granted. 
with your resiliency plan, like everybody just has that money to lift. Okay, so the incentive is to go from 9,000 to 1,000 in flood insurance, but that's 50 years to recover that money, 500,000, that's 50 years, that's longer than mortgages. It makes no sense to me. I mean, it's, um, this is kind of pie in the sky. This isn't helping the individuals who really live in this territory. Furthermore, the real issue I see is the free FAR, which FAR, I know, I get it. Everybody really feels FAR is a big deal. So an FAR of one in a manufacturing district like Red Hook keeps buildings at 25 to 30 feet, keeps them practical. Red Hook, I think, is a little bit of a gem. Anybody else who lives here might also know it, but every neighborhood is, is going to feel this, and it's coming, is that this free FAR is basically a new building type for a truck depot, and truck depots are coming into the city. What's happening is empty lots can be aggregated so that they're no longer 20 or 30 feet wide by 100 deep. You can aggregate empty lots where you can find them or demolish existing buildings or buy out to make these mega lots, 25,000 square feet, 100,000 square feet, and get free one FAR. That's a 25,000 square foot bonus of parking. So the, the, what's gonna happen is Red Hook is gonna get inundated with truck parking and truck delivery services, and it's going to change the chemistry. These buildings get 30 feet right away, and then they get their, then they get their 25,000 square feet of FAR wedding caked on top of that. And it's going to create buildings that are 90 feet tall in Red Hook. And this is, I think, problematic. I mean, I'm living with it. It's happening on the lots in my area. It's happening on the lots of all my peers. And we're really terrified. So I like the resiliency, but to give empty lots kind of this bonus space when hardworking companies, hardworking shops that are still single stories or auto zones or auto repair shops Who's going to have the money, those people who've lived there, bid boots on the ground for 20 years or more, establish the community, who's helping them? What you're doing is you're incentivizing outsiders to come in and change the landscape of a community. Okay. And I'm watching it happen, and it's coming. It's coming to Red Hook, it's gonna to come to Guanas, it's gonna to come to every community in Brooklyn unless something really changes about this. And okay. I'm saying this passionately as a homeowner and somebody who really loves it here and really wants to build, and I have my business here, I'm in, a, I'm in a ground floor garage with equipment that is vulnerable, I get it, I'm near Gowanus in Red Hook. But you know, um, if I could get my landlord to lift the building, maybe five feet, so some of this equipment is up, but to give 30 feet free is, is changing the way these buildings are gonna look. And if you're asking for commercial ground floor, it's never coming, it's going to be trucks. Okay, I appreciate. Thank you very much. Um, do yeah, you guys? There was a, there's an incredible amount to discuss there. Um, I don't. I don't know that we'll have the ability to capture everything that you talked about. So I'd love to follow up with you after this meeting, um, because you did I think raise a number of very good points. Um, but I would say that that to your very first point about the cost of retrofitting existing buildings. It is, as I said earlier, it is undoubtedly an expensive endeavor. Um, but that is not to say that, 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 that this is the sole solution. That zoning is a part of the solution, as Katie mentioned during the portion of the presentation, that we are, as a city, looking at several different means and multiple layers of resiliency. And in certain neighborhoods, there are going to be solutions that are more ably achieved than others. Um, but that said, that yes, that zoning is part of the solution, and that what we are suggesting here this evening and what we're going to be discussing over the course of what is going to be a long public review process um, before we even get to, get to the word go for Euler, um, that, that we think that these are reasonable ways of approaching this. Um, the, I think you're talking about the 30 feet of dry flood proofing exemption. Um, that would be in the instance of someone going through the expense of dry flood proofing. Dry flood proofing is a type of construction that is not likely to be seen with the exception of retail. Um, so it is likely, I'm not gonna say it's impossible, but we are not seeing uh, manufacturing uses use dry flood proofing as a way of getting that exemption. And also just to say the 30 feet, again, we're talking about going in horizontal into the site. We're not talking 
a vertical rise of 30 feet. Okay. City planning, appreciate it very much. And um, let me see here. Okay, that's it. All right, so that pretty much concludes our presentations for our borough board meeting. I uh, just want to announce that our meeting next month, um, though we did not make quorum, we were short by one. Um, next month, we, there will be items on the agenda that we will definitely need quorum, so please tell your colleagues, fellow council members, and community board members to all show up for next month to meet quorum. Um, and that is pretty much it. Oh, that's right, one more. Any unfinished business or new business? Is there anything coming up at Barrel Hall within the next month that you can tell us about while we're here? <laughs> None on my end, uh, Richard. Do you want? Excuse I, me. I didn't. I don't mean oh. I want to come to the next meeting. It's just that it kind of throws me off a little bit when I come here and then I read email a week or two later and it tells me, oh, such and such a thing is coming up, and I said, well, why didn't they mention it to us while we were all sitting in the same room? Okay, good question, good point. Um, well, I will announce uh, for my end, just one, uh, for certain, count, well, it could be related for everyone here, on March 15th, here at Brooklyn Borough Hall, um, there will be a Senate hearing regarding third party transfers, TPT, that will be taking place in the courtroom upstairs, as well as the rotunda here. This is gonna be co-hosted by um, the borough president, along with Senator Velma Nett Montgomery, as well as Assembly Member Train, Tremaine Wright. Um, that is going to be a pretty big hearing here. Um, those um, communities and community boards, especially, I know particularly within Central Brooklyn, the best Stuy area, that have been experiencing big issues regarding third party transfer and deed fraud, that, um, that will be a very important hearing that will be taking place here. Um, and this is being convened by the New York State Senate and Assembly. So I will announce that to you all now. It will be here again March 15th, which is a Friday at Brooklyn Borough Hall. The hearing will run from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. So I encourage you all to spread the word. We do have um, our the announcement on our website and there are flyers that have been distributed and we will have our liaisons who represent your respective community boards and areas to also make that announcement at, at, the, your, at your respective meetings as well. You, you're welcome. Right, and um, also for future meetings, we'll have our newsletters here um, so you guys can be able to pick up for and share for me. All right, anything else? Okay, so, oh, one more, CB14. Uh, well, motion to adjourn. <laughs> oh, well, since we don't have a quorum, I wasn't even gonna, end, yeah, I wasn't gonna even entertain a motion. Okay. Um, but before you go, I do wanna recognize um, Malik from Council Member Jamani Williams, who is now public advocate elect, Jamani Williams. So, <laughs> definitely, so I don't know if this is gonna be the last one, you, you do since for this meeting, so this is it. <laughs> all right, and definitely appreciate it. Please give now public advocate Jamani Williams all regard and congratulations and wish you all well. Other than that, thank you guys. Have a good night.